Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Journey Santa Fe. I'm Bill Dupuy. It's a delight to have everyone with us. Today, all about the Los Alamos National Lab. And to introduce our speaker, our very own Denise Ford. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I, I want to introduce uh, Greg a bit. Greg and I have known each other for, as so many of us in Santa Fe, for a very long time. But I met him, I guess I was the director of the environment department here and I came in on a Sunday and I caught him working on a uh, word processor as we had back in the day. And he looked chagrined and embarrassed and he said he knew he shouldn't be doing this on state equipment but he was writing up some things about Los Alamos and their environmental practices. And I said, why don't we do this on a weekday? So we gave Lanel their first um, RICRA violation that they had ever had. I was chased out of the director's office for presenting him with it, but uh, <laughs> yes. so it began. So Greg and I have been friends since that time. He is a graduate of Harvey Mudd with a degree in engineering and then of the Harvard University with a degree in regional planning, as I would call it and has been, uh, after working for the Environment Department, started the Los Alamos Study Group with his wife, Trish. They are a activity coming from two people of a, and, and numerous cats uh, of a volume that one can't believe, and it's partly evidenced by a number of handouts that are present over here. Something's being circulated for those who want to get on their email list. You will become, they, they believe that uh, people who are educated about what's going on in this city and state and country will, and world will become activists as they have and I, I find that to be uh, inspiring for me in, in my life. For living here in Santa Fe, it, it just is, it's really extraordinary that we're close to a place of as, as much importance as the Los Alamos National Labs are. And I find in my kind of, I've been in sort of mainstream politics despite being friends with Greg and Trish for a long time, and we, we, we think of the labs as just, it's, it's regular, it's just a regular industry for us, as though it were the hospital or Sears or something in the old days. And people don't think, we don't think about what does it mean to have uh, a facility devo devoted to, in large part, to nuclear research and to, at this time, a, a possibly growing role in, nu in new nuclear weapon design and pit, design, uh, pit production and so on. I mean, what does that mean for us in our economy? And why is it an, an accepted part of our political dialogue that every single elected official um, and, and very much on a bipartisan basis, supports the labs. What does it mean to support the labs? The other side of that, which it would immediately be thrown back from anyone here, would be, well, what would our economy look like if we didn't have the labs here? And uh, Greg has some uh, interesting and very different perspectives about that question. So I think we're going to talk today mostly about these questions of what does it mean for Santa Fe? What does it mean for us to be to be said to be dependent on the labs. What does that relationship mean for us? With that, um, I'm, I'm going to be Greg's boss again today and uh, keep him moving along. So, thank you. So, um, at Denise, Denise's suggestion, we we're going to divide this into small bits, and maybe Denise will throw a question out after each small bit, and so I will have to move very quickly. Um, I see many people here that I would like to say hello to, but we don't have time right this second. Thank you all for coming, and it, it's wonderful to be here with you. And thank you, Trish, for um, helping with all this for this um, yesterday. Um, this picture turns out to be a great deal, uh, encompass a great deal of what we have to say. Um, there is another future possible. Uh, we have to recognize that another future is possible, which may not be so simple and easy as it might seem, that uh, it that we can get there, and it will require a World War II level of engagement, and that level of engagement will come to us whether we want it or not. 
uh, that uh, it will come sooner or later in a positive form that we choose or a negative form that is chosen for us. So the mix between those two uh, is determined by how quickly we can wake up, take responsibility, and act. Um, there is a talk on our website um, which touches on those broader themes that, um, from last week uh, in Albuquerque for 350.org. Um, so we're going to have to go really fast. So we thought maybe we better look at the, some background. What is Lana? What does it do? Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, here's a slide uh, Trish discovered yesterday from a relatively recent uh, presentation by Lana. What do they do? What are they? They sustain the current stockpile, they provide options for the extension of the stockpile, and importantly, they help shape a globalized nuclear world, which I thought was a pretty good um, a phrase. Um, um, I, they said it, not me. Next. Um, some of those options, this is the default plan for the U.S. nuclear stockpile, um, going from uh, many to fewer, but newer. Um, so in the boxes are uh, what are essentially new or new-ish uh, warheads and bombs, which have, importantly, have new capabilities. And those new capabilities are very important in the nature of, of nuclear deterrence and strategic stability, and they're also very expensive. Next slide. Um, they do this experimentally, they do it uh, theoretically. Um, I was amused and interested to see this display uh, recently at the Bradbury Museum. Uh, that is a W-80 Mach warhead inside a confined vessel. Um, uh, then they have a photograph uh, in the next slide. Um, I, I mean, a, a mock-up, uh, we took a picture there, that's a W-80 warhead for the new controversial cruise missile. So the museum exhibit is not just random, uh, it, it refers to a uh, pending program and a very controversial one for a long-range standoff weapon, which would be stealthy, not counted under treaty, um, and uh, is designed to make things extremely difficult for our strategic partners in Europe and Asia, if you want to call them that. Now, uh, this, in one slide, it's one year old, but it's more or less accurate. Again, it's a Lano slot. Um, a lot of people are confused about what Los Alamos is and what it does, and how the money is spent. And you know, we heard uh, Senator Udall last week say, "Oh, the wonderful solar energy work that Los Alamos does, all the fuel cells, and all this." Well, it isn't really like that. Nuclear weapons are the main program at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Most other things relate in one way or another to nuclear weapons. If they don't relate to nuclear weapons, they relate to national security. Um, there are a few other things, but sometimes they serve uh, as much as landing pads, like lily pads, to get people to come to Los Alamos, and then they can be transferred over to more controversial things. Um, the, you will see on the pie chart on the upper right, um, R&D, 22% of the workforce, um, of the, and the uh, regular staff members, R&D, um, and uh, you can dwell on that a little bit in your uh, mind's eye. Um, you would get the impression, if you've never been to Los Alamos, that everybody's a scientist or an engineer. That's not really the case. Most people are not. Um, and those are the disciplines. And then you might also get the impression that everyone has a PhD. 33% of people working at the lab have no degree at all. Um, and next slide. Uh, so this uh, pattern is um, also true for the Department of Energy as a whole. Um, we, which is mostly nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons related things. Um, and Trish has her, what? Faster. Okay, I'm, somebody's supposed to stop me at four minutes. I am. Ah, okay. Okay, uh, next slide quickly. Uh, it's an aging laboratory. This is hard to absorb in a second. 
but um, the bottom line. Um, yeah, um, that works. Um, the the dem demography of the laboratory is getting old. The people and the missions are old. Next, let us skip that. So those are the weapons. Um, let's almost go and skip that. Ah, we do have to do this. Um, there's also a misunderstanding about what nuclear weapons do. Um, people who teach classes on nuclear weapons uh, find that their students do not understand the difference between an atomic bomb and a hydrogen bomb. And we just had a person who had been cleaning up out at and we talk speak in Albuquerque, and he said, you know, that was the first thing he said. People don't know the difference between an atomic bomb and a hydrogen bomb. We look back at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we think, okay, that's what we got. Well, it isn't what we got. Um, a modern thermonuclear weapon produces a fireball which is hundreds of times brighter than the sun. And in about a couple of, a, couple of seconds, this fireball, in the case of an 800 kiloton Russian warhead detonated over Albuquerque, that fireball would form and it would ignite almost everything that is within a visual, uh, within a line of sight from that fireball in Albuquerque. So uh, within two minutes, mass fires would form and, let's see, next, and uh, within about two minutes, mass fires start to form because of the tremendous winds from the buoyant fireball. So this is not a weapon in the ordinary sense. It is a, something which one of these weapons would uh, destroy all of Santa Fe, out to Agua Fria, to Suki, everything. Next. Okay, next. It's costly. I have to say this. It's costly. This graphic's from the New York Times from earlier this year. Um, for the next 10 years, uh, expecting to spend um, 320 billion on nuclear weapons over the next 30 years, a little more than one trillion. Next. Within the Department of Energy, endlessly rising budgets henceforth. Next. Next. Los Alamos is also a nuclear waste dump. Um, and that is an aerial picture I took from uh, Barry G several years ago. Next. Um, active nuclear waste dump. Trisha had to hang out of an airplane, take that picture. Next. <laughs> National Geographic. Next. That's it. That's a background. So, so the question Greg has uh, prepared for me here, which I think is uh, to, to make a, a little segue with, with the slides we've just seen, that I guess the question I'd ask about this, we are our city in, in general, this region, and certainly the political leadership of the state are dedicated to a growing Los Alamos National Lab for more federal expenditure, for more federal money going into LANL. So I, I think the the obvious question after considering the morality, which no one in this audience needs any help in considering the morality of nuclear we weapons, is should it be our political goal to grow Los Alamos? And, and maybe, Greg, and part of this, just I think people know this, I, I have so many friends and relationships at LANL, and, and I don't see any of those people, who, who are scientists, I, mostly for, for people I know there, I don't see any of them going out attempting to destabilize uh, the nuclear order of the world or lobbying for new nuclear weapons. Is that true of all the way up the line at LANL? My friends don't do that. Yeah. Um, it depends. Um, and of course we're not in the, uh, we're not privy to everything, but the labs put their people into congressional staff jobs, into Pentagon jobs, and there they ally with neoconservatives who definitely have that objective. So, for example, in the House Armed Services Committee, Tim Morrison is the Republican staff member, Drew Walter is his sidekick, they come from, Drew comes from Sandia, I'm not sure where Tim comes from. Tim's goal is to antagonize Russia and to impose costs on Russia with the idea of 
regime change or breaking up Russia, as Henry Kissinger summarized U.S. policy. So the way it works, of course, it's a big machine set up in the Manhattan Project. So the individual views of the scientists don't matter. And so then to the question you've presented here, the, the second question is, so, so the arms race is not moving forward of its own uh, momentum, but it's moving forward because there are lots of political actors who are causing it to move forward. I mean, we're, there's going to be a hearty discussion afterwards, which uh, I, I, and I'm not even sure how we'll do this, but I'm assuming Greg and Trish will stay till midnight until we've all talked about this. So, uh, we'll, But we'll, we'll try to move through this first. Um, with the arms race is moving forward because of the political actors and no doubt the economic ones who seek to increase uh, the U.S. the size of U.S. weapons and, and for that we need to have weapons across the world. Is this, but, but to come, it's really all about me. So is that good for Santa Fe or bad for Santa Fe? The political consent, is this good for my property values or bad? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, let me see. Let's see what's on the next slide, whether I've answered that at all. Nope. Um, no. I'm describing the new programs. No, Let's talk about Santa Fe song. Oh, all right. Um, the, it, doesn't, it hasn't really helped northern New Mexico. If you look at the statistics, our economist buddy Bill Wyda, who worked in the Pentagon, and then he was taught at the Air Force Academy, and then he was chair of economics at Colorado College, Bill used to say the central economic development error in northern New Mexico, or perhaps it was New Mexico as a whole, I can't remember, is the failure to realize that the bomb was a far-reaching mistake. So the rest of the world moves on, and we are, for some reason, still attached to the bomb, as if it were cutting edge, as if it were a great thing. And our political leaders um, are addicted. Um, they're addicted because of the money, because the laboratories can fund candidates that, to oppose people that can be primary. The, in Albuquerque, the Albuquerque Journal is a very formidable political force, and it's very difficult for Michelle Levan Grisham to go against it. So they have to trim their sails accordingly, or they feel that. They are unable to break out of that mold. Carol Miller uses the um, analogy of the World War II economy. So New Mexico stuck in a World War II economy while the rest of the world moves on. We have a really lackluster investment rate in alternative energy. Um, what we, in order to compete in the world, you can't really do it half-heartedly. You can't say, I want to devote three quarters of our political time and attention and our committee assignment choices in Congress to nuclear weapons in the military, and also I'm going to kind of be interested in renewable energy, and maybe I'll work on that a little bit, and also natural gas, because natural gas is so important. In fact, I'm for everything. Um, that really is uh, like being for nothing. <laughs> and that is the kind of politics which we have here, and it, for, the, for those of us who are in the middle class, it's barely acceptable. But, there, but as we see in the country as a whole, and in the growing divisions in our community, it is not acceptable. Just go to the schools. Look at the schools. We are not cutting the mustard we are not creating the kind of future that will attract and keep real economic development that actually adds value. Um, and part of it, and substantial part of it, is because our political loyalties are far too heavily associated with what we imagine to be the centerpiece of our economic life here in New Mexico, namely the labs, which actually employ about 2% of the people in the state. So we're really investing in the 1%. Uh, it's uh, the, with the salaries at the lab. Maybe it's you know they're in the upper upper five percent certainly. But um, that's that's what we're doing. We're investing in inequality and hoping that they're it will trickle down. Okay. Uh, maybe we better talk about plutonium. Um, this again a lab slide. There are many plutonium programs. 
because Los Alamos is the plutonium center of the weapons complex. Um, they got that job by saying that they didn't have to um, build anything. So they said, we're ready to go when, you know, when you're competing against Savannah River and other sites. We are cheaper because we are ready to go. We don't have to build anything. Next. Next. Um, so pit production is a central part of this mission and the real reason for it is because the Russians have a big pit production capability and we don't. Fortunately some people here don't know what pits ah. are and that's a lovely picture. Yes, um, we, uh, I took this uh, from an airplane we rented, uh, we could fly over Pentex in the old days. Um, and, um, so pits are the um, thistle core of the primary stage of a nuclear explosive. And they last a very long time because at Rocky Flats there was a high standard of craftsmanship. So we are living off the self-sacrificing craftsmanship of Los Alamo, uh, rather Rocky Flats, when it comes to pits. There are a lot of pits at, um, in Amarillo, uh, and they're in the uh, bunkers up on the upper side of the picture. There they are. Yeah. Um, the purpose, uh, so starting with about 2000, the idea in the Bush nuclear posture view came to be for a capability-based deterrence, which means spending money deters our enemies. Building stuff and having factory capacity um, is a deterrent in and of itself. So it becomes an, a self-licking ice cream cone. So having a factory brings us national security, spending billions on it is just another way of measuring our security. Um, hold, 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 hold back, one second. Uh, there, uh, these are the reasons. The actual managerial reason to make pits in any quantity at Los Alamos is for the proposed interoperable warhead number one, but pits are only needed for the extra warheads that we would load onto ICBMs in the event of a political breakdown with Russia. They're not actually needed for deployment. And there's a requirement. So everything is being driven by this, this number, these numbers right here. And they're completely political. They were invented by Republicans um, and pushed through Congress. They have no basis in any managerial need. And we got about one-third of people in Congress voted against to try to repeal that requirement recently. But uh, one-third is not enough. Excuse me, people in the House. So let's, let's just go through all that. Go through the... All these are very detailed. Detailed. Go through it. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, stop. Uh, so all this is located on... Um, in the um, middle of the lab, the PF4 facility that you see, the pink um, fence around, is the main plutonium facility. This is a slide of their previous plan. The yellow um, portions were canceled after being freighted up with a lawsuit. The other parts are other related infrastructure. That's just to give you an idea that we're talking actually about billions of dollars in construction and investment. Yes. A lawsuit by our organization. Yes, a lawsuit by our organization. Thank you very much. So there's the main plutonium facility, the square thing, um, and the red are the proposed underground modules. Um, it says artist conception, but that's actually the drawing. Um, we just couldn't take it with us. Um, that thing is the most expensive, is to be the most expensive construction project in the history of the state. Uh, $1.4 billion for that modest building. Um, it had no mission that would be, that it could do under the original plan, so now it's undertaking, it's being uh, given a massive retrofit. So I better, uh, and of course it's lots of fun for uh, the people in charge, um, and those, that's the coterie of people who are making the decisions about the future of the state, um, and you could make another picture today that, would be much the same with different faces. I, I guess to uh, anticipate where you're going, I, I perhaps with the slides, we're what looking, stepping back some and looking at the international picture and where Los Alamos fits in that. Um, and we know that President Obama came in as actually a strong advocate of disarmament. 
the term that uh, you use as well. So where, where do we see the international picture going for nuclear weapons and where, where does the United States fit within that and where does Los Alamos fit within that? I think there may be a number of slides that cover that, but yeah. what's, what's driving yeah. it now? Where's the U.S. trying to go? The U.S. is trying to go toward, there's been, there has been a struggle. Um, and um, the dominant faction in the Obama administration right now seeks greater war fighting capabilities with nuclear weapons. So um, the idea is escalatory control so that our expeditionary forces can not be defeated in conflicts in Asia or Europe or anywhere. Um, China, as we know, uh, and India and Russia and are all full of smart people and good weapon designers. And when um, you're operating in their backyard, they might uh, hit you with a missile. And so they might defeat you. And plus, they are good at cyber war and all these things too. So we, um, the idea is to prevail in all conflicts and control all aspects of the escalatory ladder. This is a type of deterrence which is different than, say, a second strike capability, which would, in principle, deter an aggressor against the United States homeland, as we say. Uh, maybe we should start talking German. Hi, um, But, um, <clears throat> so that's different. And this mission requires an elaborate number of nuclear weapons and more of them. So there is a basically a treaty break breakup plan. Um, because the New START Treaty expires in 2021, and um, and then there are, uh, in the case of the cruise missiles, they're not really counted under the treaty. So um, a thousand cruise missile bodies um, can be added to the present arsenal of 1,500, and, and then in addition, the qualitative improvements in existing warheads make, in the case of submarine warheads, um, for the purposes of attacking hard targets, they will be three times as effective as the old warhead. So the W76-1, you only need one of those to attack uh, with reliability a Russian uh, missile silo, whereas before you needed three. So as some people, the administration, have, have, dis have explained to me with anguish um, that the Russians must consume their entire New START arsenal to threaten our ICBMs, whereas we will have now uh, many extras. So we're in an arms race, and it has many facets. Thank you. I, I, um, I, I've been reminded that, we, that we've got an audience of great people uh, chomping at the bit, so I'll just ask a few questions to ask Greg some questions. Let me just ask, when I, you know, when I hear these presentations, this isn't my field, and I can do this in water, and I can do this in environment, but I can't Sorry. do this in nuclear. No, no, no. But I, so the question for you is, how did you and Trish manage to get your teeth into this, um, and how can people who are not um, familiar with the entire uh, global picture for nuclear weapon, nuclear arms race, how can we get our teeth into this in a helpful way? What, what's what's our role as citizens of this state? Should we skip toward the end? Yes, we should. Okay. Let's skip um, let's uh, go all the way down to the last few slides. Um, keep going way far, way far, uh, way far. Uh, and um, so the we are now at a stage in our combined existential crisis that the old way of let's study something and then figure out how to get involved uh, has got to be really abridged. And we are farther, oh, you're going to go past, I'll be on the There we go. Keep, keep going down to, uh, keep going. Yeah. All right, keep going. There we go. Oh, oh, back. Okay. Um, there we go, thank you. Um, I think we should change our question from what can we do to who am I? 
and what will I become? We are we now are telling people that the sine qua non of of uh, citizenship at this point is mobilization. We should mobilize now and work uh, and absorb the issue content in the process. So we have a big problem with our naturally passive um, uh, way of being and we need to uh, break out of this mold. So that's, I'm sorry it's a little philosophical here, but um, really um, we have to decide that we're going to do something first. That's the first thing. Um, and we have to start doing it and learn as we go because the issues are all very connected. We cannot, we cannot succeed with the kind of stovepipes that we are used to having and working within. And the, so uh, we have, uh, uh, you, you have to place, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh a long time ago in an early book talked about koan study and Zen and said, place yourself in the circle of the koan. So you have to, that's the first step, not the last step. You have to step into the world of citizenship and commitment and then learn as you go. Change your life. Then uh, we work with people in Albuquerque working on police violence, our next door neighbor, and we find a lot of common ground. They've helped us out recently, we help them out. And we are not going to get anywhere with our tiny little slivered up issues. Um, I think uh, uh, intersectionality is something, oh, but that's it. Um, uh, next slide, maybe. Um, because um, without even thinking about it, usually our first question, what can I do that's actually not very hard? And what can I do within the framework of my present set of commitments? But that is really the problem. And um, so, um, promises and vows, um, revolutionary change usually requires daily interaction with people who are similarly engaged. Um, uh, Denise, the scholar, will recognize uh, Hannah Arendt here, um, in that um, vows and promises extend the vital moment in which action takes place. And uh, it's a, a mixed um, and we need to think about working full time. So that is a model. We keep stressing that. We think that any church uh, that can support a full time minister ought to be able to support a youth activist in climate and energy and anti uh, working against war, since we now have continuous war. Um, and we. Uh, so as you gain expertise, then you become more and more valuable. And I think Ralph Nader a couple of years ago said, you know, there's actually only about six full-time climate lobbyists on our side in Washington, despite everything, and uh, which sort of shocked me. But then I looked at, well, who are the full-time lobbyists on nuclear disarmament in Washington? Very few. Next. Um, and, of course, uh, the Gandhian constructive program uh, stands before us um, beckoning all the time. Um, and the field of leadership is essentially unoccupied. There are lots of people doing lots of things, but there's a lot of room for more. Um, and I want to um, sort of say that, um, that for those of us who are getting older, we need to enable young people. We can't just say, oh, go to college and learn stuff and uh, come back in five or ten years and uh, then maybe you can help uh, fix the world. Uh, well, we don't have five or ten years. I, I want to, uh, I think we're going to, we, Greg brought 80 slides and I think we let him do ten. And so he obviously, um, and, and the Los Alamos study group has really good material on the website. For those of you who have signed up to be on his 
email um, listserv, you're going to be getting very deep, um, as, as this presentation has indicated, deep and, and provocative emails from them over time. I want to turn people to those. Thank you for your time. And then I think as we, as we open the questions, we'll just ask how long you want to broadcast for. Is, is that the question? Because I, I, I think our, our, our guests are willing to talk for some period of time, and I have a feeling we'll run over the hour. Well, we will, uh, no, we'll, we'll let you know when we get near the danger okay. thing. All right, thank you. While we uh, have your questions, folks, we're going to pass the basket. So if you have an extra doubloon, we'd be happy to take it and help us with our expenses. Greg, first question is here. Yes. Yes, to bolster your argument, the evidence about New Mexico being economic deprived. New Mexico and Arizona became both states in 1912. Look where Arizona is today, look where New Mexico is today. The other question is, is that there's been a long discussion of moving land somewhere else. Is it the of the purpose of being a solvent and out of the way is obsolete now? So we can talk moving it down to a Cooper Air Force Base. I'd like to comments on that. Also, um, you're talking about essentially corruption. And corruption doesn't exist without duplicity or duplicity. And that's what you seem to be talking about. The main question is, why is there a proliferation of nuclear weapons anyway, when if we use them, the world's gone? I mean, there's, and the experts keep saying there's going to be the next 20 years of the land or in Asia, with exchange of nuclear weapons, the fallout goes around the world, so why do we keep building things that are self-destructive? Yes. Now let me try to take those in reverse order, if I can remember them. Um, the part of the problem is the bubble or echo chamber that forms around self-interested parties with nuclear weapons and with many other things. So they never, they, um, the people who think that more nuclear weapons or different nuclear weapons or better nuclear weapons are what we need, um, have managed because uh, partly consciously, partly unconsciously, blocked out all of the voices. And the other voices are not necessarily strong enough to penetrate the barriers. So, so part of it is a bubble. And uh, General Horner, who bombed uh, Iraq into smithereens in the uh, Desert Storm, was at a conference um, that I was at. He said, we have to, what we have to fear is a cadre of Air Force officers who actually believe in nuclear weapons. That, that's been very rare in my lifetime, but we, it could happen if the lab people and the military people get together and they become more ideological um, then we could get this cadre of Air Force people who are true believers. I believe we have it now. Um, on comments about corruption, I think that that's very important what you said, that we have to call a spade a spade, and that is what we have, and we need to be using language like that more in order to free our responses from their rut. So thank you for that. On moving Los Alamos, um, the fixed... The fixed investments are daunting, and the isolation is uh, helps with. They wouldn't move it because um, it's dangerous. <clears throat> the part that is not dangerous can move, and in a way that's happened already to Livermore. What could happen is, in a better world, would be a gradual downsizing, and and uh, that we would. Uh, that would be devoutly to be wished. And so, in effect, people would move out of the laboratory into the civilian economy where they could be productive. Okay, question back here. Yes. Hello, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, you said something about what can I do. Um, it seems to me, I look around, there aren't many young people here. I think part of the reason for that is that the there's a prevalence in our society uh, propagated by various interests um, to perpetuate a couple of myths that I think stand in the way. One is the myth of defense, the idea that all of this is for our defense. The other is the myth of plenty, that much more of everything is better. And it goes back to what you said about living simply. Now, I wanted your thoughts on that, but I I also, these are sort of new ideas to me, so 
I'm interested in what you have to say about that, how that myth of defense is propagated. Uh, I think it prevents people from becoming aware of the fact that there is this overarching danger. Yes. The, the idea that you might feel secure living in Santa Fe knowing that these people up there are making these wonderful weapons, but at the same time, um, you forget or you don't find out about the fact that you may be facing radiological and chemical harm in the future, uh, you know, your next generations, etc. And, and Do you what, have a question, please? What are your thoughts on the myth of defense and the myth of defense? Um, the myth of defense is, is certainly that. Um, uh, it, it, George Kennan, when he was head of the State Department planning office in about 1947, maybe some scholar, uh, you can uh, think of the exact date, but um, wrote that uh, the, our primary uh, purpose here is to um, and perpetuate the uh, situation where we have 6% of the world's population and consume 25% of the resources. And that's very near the core of that problem and it connects both of those questions. And it's a very, uh, it's an increasingly important analysis. So the 1947 analysis has come right around um, because uh, contrary to popular belief, um, oil uh, is limiting and other resources are limiting and uh, there is not enough for all the countries of the world to grow their economy simultaneously. Over there. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Um, Sally Denton, as you know, wrote a wonderful book called Profiteering and I would highly recommend it. And uh, Greg has some of his comments in there. Um, the book is about the history and the present moment of Bechtel, and I wanted to ask you about that, what you experience as um, some of the, the dangers or the assistance that Bechtel might offer in terms of um, leading us to either greater mm -hmm. expenditure on defenses or a greater sense of peace. Um. It's, of course, Bechtel is a very secretive uh, organization. Um, wherever you go in Washington, you will, you, it's very easy to run into the Bechtel lobbyists. Um, they're there. You talk, you chat them up uh, in line waiting to get into hearings. You see them in conferences. <clears throat> and uh, there was a, a young woman who was kind of an understudy of the main Bechtel lobbyist, and I asked her, where she worked before, well, she, uh, for Exxon. And um, so, uh, uh, I thought, no, really poor thing. And they're, they're there, they're active. They're not the only ones. So there's a kind of a, a group of, you know, Lockheed Martin, Northrop from the Bechtel. They have, um, they're very, very active and they play a an enormous role in all of this. Not just directly, but indirectly. So, the expansion of NATO, maybe you know this already, and I cannot remember where this article appeared, it was Salon maybe a couple of years ago, um, that uh, the expansion of NATO eastward to the Russian border was orchestrated in part through uh, lobbying in Europe with those governments and in part with immigrant communities in swing states um, here in the country and in part through soirees in Washington, D.C. orchestrated by Lockheed Martin lobbyists. And all of that worked together to make the magic happen, which, um, which in, uh, in 1996 um, and seven and following led Bill Clinton to expand NATO eastward, which had the effect of increasing uh, threats, uh, tensions with Russia, and uh, increasing the arms market. Um, so, yes, they're all very active, and they don't see any, you know, ideological problem. And they sleep well at night, I think. Question here. To be utopian for a moment, yes. you said that we also had the choice to create a more positive yes. future in Northern New Mexico. <coughs> so, as citizen activists. 
what would be our first steps to turn Los Alamos into a garden of earthly delights <laughs> devoted to hydroponic gardening right. and solar energy and right. wind energy and right. solving answers to the problems of cancer that the scientists up there are working on. Serious, I do actually yes, seriously, because if you don't have utopian ideals and visions, sure. you can't really make changes. Right. So we can have a long conversation about this, but the short answer is that the de decreasing the role of Los Alamos on the negative side of the ledger, you're, it's a long way before you reach the zero point. So the best thing that, that could happen sim uh, you know, simply is to decrease its budget. Um, and so cutting Los Alamos' budget sends a tremendously positive signal uh, to people in Washington, to the young people who are being recruited, and others. So first, try to do no harm, or do less harm, uh, would be the Hippocratic uh, version of that. And probably Los Alamos would be the very last thing in northern New Mexico to entertain such a future or contribute to it. So, oh, I know that. So the, um, if uh, we could talk our senators and um, then Ray Lujan into providing uh, incentives for people to leave Los Alamos and go to work for those types of things, a few of them might do it. Um, they could take early retirement, um, get paid off, and then leave the lab. It's very expensive to do anything at the lab. And it's so expensive that it's very difficult for any new ideas to even make the tiniest root note. Hello, Greg. Um, yes. uh, concerning the long-range standoff weapon, it's what's going to use the new, the new warhead that's, being, that's going to be designed at Los Alamos. I know that there's some political controversy about it. Uh, the way Clinton was asked about it. I think Bernie Sanders said he didn't support the, the one trillion over 30 years. Where does that stand politically in the funding now, and, and how could I uh, exercise some leverage on... Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, people, thank you for that very good question. Uh, <laughs> um, our senators and Congress people are four square behind this new warhead and the cruise missile that it is to be on. They should be hearing from us. They should be hearing from us. We should go to their donors um, and uh, get their donors to call um, and say, what are you doing? You can kiss my check goodbye. And if you don't uh, make a speech against this weapon. So Udall is counted upon to support this. Heinrich is as well. And um, then Ray Lujan is not as important. He's not on the right committees and he's junior. Um, so doing whatever we can, confronting them at the farmer's market, um, at their offices, um, doing creative things which uh, uh, land you in the newspaper and us, um, uh, because they read newspapers. So the usual things, just more of them. Thank you. And we're approaching milestone A on this, the Pentagon milestone, which will, which will indicate a greater, it's a decision point in the Pentagon in August. And which is, you know, people are not in Washington. And so the, um, this is acquiring momentum there, but it has serious opposition from Senator Feinstein and other people. And it can be beaten. There are many, uh, many years to go on this. But uh, the farther it goes, the worse it gets. Let's take that question there and then we'll come back here. Okay. okay. My name is Asper, and I also am a volunteer for the study group. And I'm going to say something before I ask my question. And that is that I've recently been to both the, the deterrent school, which is in, run by someone named Adam. And I just think of Luth Lexor when I think of his last name. And I know it. Louther. Louther. Okay, Adam Louther. When we talk about it being an echo chamber, believe me, they, they have young people there. And the things they're hearing would scare everybody here because Greg's representing it really accurately. Then I also went to the deterrent school, and it was, or the deterrent summit, 
And it was basically companies who want your tax dollars, and they want billions of them to continue doing this. And it, it looks like Los Alamos is very quiet and on the hill. It's not internationally at all. It's scaring the other countries' pants off. And if we want to talk about scaring people's pants off, if this group showed up either Heinrich's office or Udall's office or Ben Ray Lujan's office, I'm not sure they'd be able to work for a week because you guys present a force. People like you, people like our intern in the back are very powerful in what they do. And so one of the things I'd like to ask is how many of you have ever thought of showing up for a meeting at the deterrence school? We know when they are, we know what these people are doing. And believe me, you would be a balanced point of view, which I have not seen. I've only seen stories about that. And I want Greg to add to that. If that's. I, I think that, you know, we might. It's difficult. They've done their thing in New Mexico now. Um, and they, their goal, as they explained it very carefully, was to focus, uh, have focused lobbying on the decision makers. They know their message is not popular with the public, so they want to just, you know, get their little coterie of people, the senators, and um, uh, on their side. Um, at this point, the targets would be the senators. They've worked themselves into powerful positions, and as Astrid says, um, this would be a powerful group. And um, people here in Santa Fe, um, talk to us. We have uh, people here who work with you. Uh, we should be talking to them in very stern terms because we can't, we didn't really say this very well, we can't have all these pri different priorities. Nuclear weapons are financially, ideologically, politically, institutionally contradictory to sustainability, to justice, to the kind of future which would bring this community together and allow it to grow and prosper. Here, here. Yeah. Yeah. Question here. Well, speaking of uh, senators, I wanted to single out Tom Udall. And um, I actually think he's perhaps our biggest problem with those who want to deeply impact the laboratory. But part of the problem is that he he has the appearance of being so liberal. And I note that he sits on the Senate Energy and Water Development Appropriations Subcommittee. He'll probably end up chairing that subcommittee someday when the Dems take back the Senate and Diane Feinstein uh, retires. And then I know for a fact that he rolled Diane Feinstein back in 2012 on the B61-12 Life Extension uh, Program. Anyway, to end this with a question, what to do about Tom Udall? Yeah. 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 Um, every, everything that Jay said, I concur with him. That's all true. And he is the pivotal person. And that's a, I guess I was in denial about the future when Diane uh, retires. It's bad enough when staff people retire. Um, Until we can, uh, they get coverage from the environmental groups because they see the environmental uh, demographic as more or less including the practically non existent peace demographic. Um, and so, this is one of the reasons why we need to reach across the boundaries of issues and of organizations and say, look, you know, you're getting a tenth of a loaf from Tom Udall on the environment. Um, are you gonna really be satisfied with the tenth of a loaf? Is that you know gonna be good enough? Um, because he's he's really setting us up for quite a different future. There need to be some serious conversations with other organizations in other fields, and his political support eroded. This is old fashioned stuff. It is just the same kind of thing that our grandparents would have done. And, but we have to actually do it. Mm -hmm. Hi, Greg. Um, I don't know, it's not, no, it's on. Uh, I am on your email list, and your appropriately named Los Alamos Study Group. Um, however, I would like to make a suggestion that all of these practical things that you are talking about 
should be on the website. Or, and, and in your email notices, very specifically, Martin Heinrich, who is just as bad as Tom Udall, um, is going to be appearing at such and such and such and such. Get out your um, banners, your signs, etc., and go. Um, more practicality on the website, please. Thank you. That's good. Um, uh, we agree. We um, we put them there, and then they get buried uh, in back a few bulletins, and so we'll do that. Um, as for, um, as you know, it's difficult now to know where people appear. They don't um, say, usually, often, more than a day or two ahead of time. Um, because, partly because, uh, um, what's her name, got shot in Arizona? Gabby. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it, there's a security issue, and partly because they don't want to take those kind of questions. So it's a little bit of sleuthing to figure out where they will appear. Um, so sometimes you have to take the battle to them. That was just it, question here. It, but it, your your broader point is very is a very very good one. Yes, thank, thank you, you. Yeah, Chris. Close. 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 Hold it very close to your mouth. Great. Is well, a slight change of direction here. I, yes. I I worry about the nuclear arms race, but in a little bit different way. Uh, I I look at Ukraine and I look at what's going on in Syria, where we're toe to toe with the Russians. And I think that on my speculation about the future of the, of the way this thing ends is that we have an accidental start to World War III and that we have a nuclear exchange because we just don't control it. We, we're not controlling our world very well in our, and we're pushing the Russians in some dangerous ways. So the question is, uh, this, has been, this was an open question, I'm not sure where it is today, hence my question is, what are we doing about de-alerting the stockpile? Because if it comes down to an accidental start to World War III, we need to worry about de-alerting. Right. Um, your question is, a, of course, a very good one. Um, at this uh, Strategic Deterrence Coalition Symposium in Albuquerque, I posed that question to Cecil Haney, both privately, uh, the head, who's the head of STRATCOM, both privately and in the plenary session. And, of course, he looks with this bland... <laughs> don't worry, everything's under control, kind of look. Um, um, but yes, we're, we're terribly worried about this as well. Um, the de-alerting question is floating around somewhere in the White House. As you know, Bruce Blair and Global Zero are working on it. Um, Bruce has very high contact. Uh, very high access in the administration. Um, the problem, sort of institutionally, is the taking ICBMs off alert. Um, them being on alert is part of their rise on detra. It's like, you know, more than halfway toward get it. We're trying to figure out what to do with Tom Udall. I'd like you to know that he's considering leaving his Senate seat early and he plans to run for governor. Oh, okay. so. We may have a real problem in New Mexico, but at least we get them out of D.C. And, oh, well, thank you. That's yes, and Michelle Lujan Grisham is one, so we have a few choices. And the other thing I wanted to say, nobody's mentioned WIPP, W-I-P-P's mm -hmm. WIPP. WIPP, that's where we have all those underground containers. They are leaking, and they've been leaking for a long time. Well, I went to a meeting where Renee, the city council, was there. And we discussed, what do you do with them? Well, Susanna has a great plan. We can make money. We're going to take in South Carolina and Idaho's at Germany and France's nuclear waste. But that's not the worst of it. A week ago on television, on a local news, I saw Susanna leaking for the last 8 to 10 years on Airport Road are more of those barrels. They use kitty litter down at WIP. Here, they're planning to just get them and get them up to the labs immediately. What do we do about this? Uh, you are raising a complex of questions that are complex. And uh, the, once you start down the road of being friendly to nuclear waste, then it becomes easy to keep going. Uh, and you could have gone on to mention, and you probably would have, um, if you were less polite, you could have gone on. Uh, but uh, the, there are two 
well, two licenses pending or about to be pending for interim storage sites for the nation's commercial spent nuclear fuel, one um, just across the Texas line in Andrews and the other uh, bit halfway between uh, Carlsbad and Hobbs. And uh, the California Public Utility Commission um, will experience a lot of pressure to move spent fuel out of San Onofre and Diablo Canyon pretty soon. And so um, where will it go? And the, there's, we have a slightly different take on some of this than perhaps others. Um, we, we really need to have a big public conversation about it. Uh, we, we are now at a place in our society where we are facing multiple crises at the same time. And there need to be solutions. And they won't be perfect. And uh, I'm not sure that um, interim storage uh, of, of, of the nation's spent nuclear fuel uh, between Carlsbad and Hobbs is one, is one of those good ideas, but uh, we are in the crosshairs for a, a large amount of nuclear waste of various kinds. Some of, and it's not all the same, and I beg you and everyone to not throw it all, even though we use the term nuclear waste, there's some that is not too bad, some that is really horrible, and there's it's a matrix of technical things. And but we um, we could be we we could really be in uh, in the crosshairs for a lot of them. Okay, we're near the detonation point. Time for one more question. <laughs> uh, yes, um, my name is Leslie Lacan. Um, it's going to be difficult to address problems at the lab, problems with the environment, problems with guns, problems with trade, without a new Congress. And so I'd like to suggest to people to go home and look up Brand New Congress, which is an organization starting by some current, former Bernie Sanders supporters, uh, workers, I should say, or volunteers, who are going around trying to establish a, um, an office in every congressional district in the, in the country to try to get progressives um, or elected to Congress uh, using the same kind of um, uh, fundraising style that Bernie used, that, what that is to say, not corporate, just you know, uh, people powered. So if we want to change things, we need a new Congress, and that might be a good way to do it. So look up for a new Congress. Yeah. Yes. And I, I want to be sure and emphasize that we should think about putting more boots on the ground, more people. Um, we, there's a lot of young people in this community that see what's happening to the planet, they're looking for careers, they're looking for a way to make a difference, they're, um, and they need us in our generation to help. And we can't just sort of say that, well, somebody else is going to take care of this. We have gradually aged and grown uh, into the point where we are the somebody else. Thank you. Well, I'm going to thank Greg and uh, hope everyone will stay involved.